Hey everyone, and welcome back to Policy Punchline. Here on the show, we interview scholars, policymakers, and business executives about some of the most urgent issues and frontier ideas in our world today. Our guest today is Lord Mervyn King. Lord King is a professor of economics and law at the NYU Stern School of Business and the School of Law, as well as the former governor of the Bank of England. His most recent book, Radical Uncertainty, co-authored with John Kay, examines rationality, decision-making under uncertainty, and the flaws with modern economic thinking. Lord King, thanks so much for being here with us today. It's a pleasure to be with you. Well, I, I'd love to just start with what motivated you to write Radical Uncertainty? What problem were you trying to address? So as you said, it's a co-authored book with John Kay. And John Kay and I wrote a book on the British tax system many years ago. And just before I left the Bank of England in 2013, there was a conference and we were both at the conference. <clears throat> and quite independently, we had come to the view that it was impossible to understand the financial crisis, which had ended a couple of years earlier, without thinking in terms of the sort of uncertainty that you couldn't quantify. And we were very struck by the fact that uh, Mr. Vinear, the chief financial officer of Goldman Sachs, at the beginning of the financial crisis had said, gosh, we're seeing 25 standard deviation events several days in a row. And that's clearly not the case. You can't see 25 standard deviation events several days in a row because that would be something that you might see once every 100 billion years longer than the life of the universe. What he was really saying was that the models that Goldman Sachs have been using to think about risk simply didn't apply when we had the financial crisis. And I think both of us then felt that modern macroeconomics had gone off the rails somewhat by trying to constrain uncertainty exclusively in terms of measurable probabilities. And that underlay both the theory of economic models that were being used and the practical interpretation. And we felt actually, no, you need to understand what we call radical uncertainty to make sense of an event like the financial crisis. So then we decided to um, go back and write another book together. And that's the what came out of it was radical uncertainty. And like you just touched on, I think one of the underlying themes of the books is that there are serious flaws with economic models. And one of the flaws that, that you discuss in depth is that um, there, there's this assumption of rational behavior, that, that all humans are these rational computer-like optimizers. And uh, you, you critique that pretty heavily. And can you tell us a little bit about your critique of that assumption? So both mainstream economics and also behavioral economics, which has expanded enormously as a subfield in recent years, both take it as essentially given without any serious uh, attempt to think through the consequences of this. They take the assumption that people behave rationally in the following sense, that they optimize and they maximize, for example, expected utility of their households or profits if it's a company or social welfare if it's a government. And the, the basis for doing this is the idea that we can enumerate all possible events that could occur in the future. And we can attach probabilities to those events. They may be subjective probabilities. So that is your probability of some unknown event in the future it might be different from mine, but we both have these probabilities. And once you assume that people have these probabilities, then it seems quite natural to assume that they will get utility from certain outcomes in the future. And then we multiply the probability of that event occurring by the utility you get from it. And you add these things up across all possible events and you maximize your expected utility. Now, I think the weakness in that line of argument is that radical uncertainty precludes it. And it does it first because you can't enumerate all the things that will happen in the world. And secondly, even if you could imagine generic events like a pandemic, uh, 
you can't attach probabilities to them. And there is a, the, the question is, why do we assume that people have these probabilities that we can attach to, to events in the future? And the answer was given in the 1920s by Frank Ramsey, a brilliant Cambridge, England, um, mathematician, philosopher, economist, who probably had the good sense to die at 26, becoming known as a great genius who died before his time, having made basic contributions in these fields. But Frank Ramsey argued that, oh, we, we can work out what these probabilities are because you simply look at the odds at which people will bet on various outcomes. But the fact is, and this is never really examined properly in economics, most people do not bet on most things. And there's a very good reason for it, because most people might think, well, here's an event, I can probably think of defining it, but I wouldn't dream of betting on it because the kind of people who would choose to bet with me know much more about the event than I do, and I'll be foolish to bet with these people. It's, it's summarized beautifully in the musical Guys and Dolls, where the two heroes are talking to each other in a cafe and speculating about bets, and they always make lots of bets. And one of them says to the other, well, here's a bet we really have to go for. And the other says, he says, no. I'm going to tell you now the advice that my father gave me when I was a little boy. And he said, Daddy said to me, son, I can't give you a great education at Princeton or elsewhere, and I can't give you money to take with you, but I can give you an incredibly important piece of advice. One day, someone is going to come to you and say, here's an unopened pack of playing cards, still sealed. And I bet you I can make the jack of spades jump out of this pack of cards and squirt cider in your ear. Son, you do not take that bet. Because if you do, as sure as anything, you'll have an ear full of cider. And that is the basic message. Most people will not bet on this. They don't have probabilities. They know that other people know more about the events than they do. So the whole philosophical basis of assuming that people have subjective probabilities and we can enumerate the various events to which those probabilities can be attached is simply deeply, deeply flawed. And I'll give you one simple example. If we've been uh, sitting in uh, the summer of 2019, as John Kay and I were when we wrote our book, we wrote in our book in 2019, we should expect to be hit by an epidemic of an infectious disease resulting from a virus that does not yet exist. Now, some people might say, gosh, you were prescient. You must have known COVID-19 was coming. But we didn't. We didn't know COVID-19 was coming. We weren't prescient. What we knew was that there were things called pandemics, and it was likely at some point that we would experience it. But the idea that any of us could have said in the summer of 2019, you know what? I think the probability of a pandemic coming out of Wuhan in China in December is 17% or 62% or any other number. It's a meaningless statement. You can talk about things being likely or unlikely, but you can't attach precise probabilities to them. And indeed, it was Frank Ramsey himself who critiqued this view by saying that great damage to our academic subjects is scholasticism. That is the attempt to pretend that things which are inevitably vague can be given a precise meaning. And so many things about the future, you can't do that. The whole idea of um, an iPhone, or lots of new products which will become available in the future that we can't imagine now. These are things which, from today's perspective, you know, we can't define precisely all the goods and services that will be available in the future. In just the same way as when I was young and I was your age, I could not have said to you, you know what, I think in 30, 40 years time, there's going to be something called an iPhone. And I bet you the chance of that is sort of 73%. 
you just can't imagine the, the, these outcomes. Much of the future is inevitably vague and we have to learn how to cope with it. That's why I think the, the idea that rational behavior can be defined only in terms of expected utility maximization is profoundly wrong. And that people are rational, but they're rational because they understand that you cannot capture the problems that we face in life in a way that can be described solely by expected utility maximization. Why do you think this idea became so fundamental to economics? Because I, I feel that if you, you said this to any student or really anyone on the street, they would say, no, that, that's ridiculous. No one actually does that. Why do you think it you know, took such strong root in the field? Well, I think there were two reasons why it took root in the field. One was that the, the role of models is not to be a description of the world, but deliberately to be an extreme simplification of it, such that we can develop insights that we can then take with us into the world when we confront real problems. And I think, um, you know, whether you think of George Akerlof and his Lemons paper about where he talked about secondhand cars, the point of his paper was that the textbook descriptions we get in the very first class that there's a supply curve and a demand curve and the equilibrium price is where they intersect simply is not true when there is asymmetric information between buyer and seller because the price at which the seller is willing to sell conveys information to the potential buyer and his demand curve then shifts. And that's a very important insight. But what George Akerlof was not doing was trying to describe how the secondhand car market actually works. He wanted a simple model where you learn an, an intuitive idea that there's more to supply and demand than the basic view and that in it, Unequally distributed information can upset the way the price system works. It's fundamentally important insight. But his paper wasn't a description of how particular markets work. David Ricardo, uh, comparative theory of trade, comparative advantage theory of trade. An incredibly powerful idea that a country that is absolutely more productive and more efficient at producing everything than another country can still benefit by trading with a country that is less efficient. And this is in counterintuitive. And he did it in terms of an example of England exporting wool to Portugal and Portugal exporting wine to England. But if you look, he did it with a numerical example, but it was a model. But if you look at the, the, the numbers he used, it's not a description of actually what happened in trade between England and Portugal. It's a very simple paradigm which enables you to understand an extremely important point of economics. But good models are not descriptions of the world. And I think one of the things that's gone wrong is that people feel that their models must be descriptions of the world as opposed to being um, ways in which we can develop a powerful intuition to give us insights that we then take when we go and think about the world and real problems. That's the first reason. I think the second reason is just, if you can't write down something you can maximize, what do you tell graduate students to do when they're trying to write a job market paper? That I fear is uh, one of the motivations. And you know, you know, economics ought to be about the world, not just about what gets published in journals. Do you think that, right, I mean, when you talk about the Ricardian model of trade, it's you know, very simplistic and it's easy to say, okay, this is just a you know, very simple representation of more complex phenomenon. But do you think that as these models have become more mathematically complex and esoteric, it's kind of created this illusion that economics is more scientific than it actually is? I don't think the use of mathematics as such has caused the problem. Some of the most important insights in, and powerful in, insights in economics have come from using highly mathematical models. I mean, the whole Arrow de Brewer idea of a general equilibrium of an economy 
with contingent commodities stretching out into the future is extraordinarily powerful because it demonstrates how strong the assumptions have to be to argue that a competitive market equilibrium is efficient. And it undermines the argument in many ways. I think it's the Arrow de Brewer model, which was published in the early 50s, that if only John Maynard Keynes had been able to read that before he wrote the general theory, he would have had a very strong basis for saying, you know, think about what Arrow de Brewer is telling you. Most of the markets that you would need in order to demonstrate that a competitive equilibrium is efficient and hence doesn't exhibit unemployment, those markets don't exist. Uh, and they don't exist because you can't imagine all the things that could happen in the future. So radical uncertainty is, in my view, crucial to understanding Keynesian economics. And it's something which that highly mathematical Arrow de Brewer model fleshed out as a final rigorous proof of intuitions that economists from Adam Smith onwards have had. So it's not the use of mathematics as such. It's the illusion that by writing a more complicated model, you are getting something which is a genuine description of the world. And the point about physics, which is why it's so different from economics, is that physics is about laws of nature, which we believe do not change over time. The, the motion of the planets around the sun is well approximated by Newtonian physics. This is something that we've seen for hundreds of years. There's no obvious change. The, we can observe it. We have theories which explain why there's no reason for it to change. But none of this is true in economics because in economics, the laws will change with the structure of the economy. They're not fixed. They change over time. And most important of all, and this is something which we should have understood from the work on both adaptive and then rational expectations, what happens in the economy depends on what we believe and what we think about it. You know, the motions of Mars around the sun does not depend upon what Mars thinks about the sun or thinks might happen in the future. So physics is a very different world from the world of economics where we're talking about how people behave. And we can use scientific methods to study and analyze it. What we can't do is to pretend that what we're looking at is a scientific process driven by fixed, unchanging laws of nature that don't depend upon what we think or believe about it. And do you think that uh, finance practitioners, you know, investors like George Soros or, or Warren Buffett have a better you know, understanding of this of radical uncertainty than academics and policymakers? I think in many ways they do. Uh, one of the things that very striking is that those very successful investors understand the difference between the insights you get from a model and a description of the world. So whether it's portfolio theory, whether it's the efficient markets hypothesis, let's take that one, the efficient markets hypothesis. You wouldn't want anyone investing your pension or your money to be doing it without understanding the efficient markets hypothesis. Basically, it says before you buy anything, if you get a good idea, and you think, gosh, we should buy this, ask yourself the question, why do you think you're the first person to think it's a good idea? Maybe it's priced in to the current uh, market price. On the other hand, if you want to earn money in the market, you do need to ask yourself the question, you know, what is happening in the market? And most of the ways in which people like Ron, Warren Buffett and others have made money is by identifying deviations of the actual market from the pure efficient market hypothesis. So the efficient market hypothesis is not a description of how the world works because there are so many ways in which small amounts at the margin may be can be earned because the world isn't explained by the efficient market hypothesis. But at the same time, time it's very important to understand the insight generated by the efficient markets hypothesis and i think that people like buffett combine those two 
the mistake of so many model builders is to say, I've got this neat model. It's got to be explained the world. And I'm determined that it will. So in that sense, the best way to understand the world is you're not throwing out the models and forecasts, but using them to supplement a more holistic, narrative-driven view of the world. Yes, I think that's, that's exactly right. I mean, economists have a lot to offer because they think about the world in a different way from non-economists. And they have insights into how an economy works derived from models. These are very important and very valuable. But the big mistake is, is to pretend that these models are literal descriptions of the world. And that's why, in many ways, theoretical models could be more useful than so-called empirical models, at least in macroeconomics and phenomenon which relates to the future. Because the theoretical models are ones where you get deep insights into how a market economy functions. But you're not led to, no one pretends that they're real descriptions of the world. Where the problem comes is when people write down models and think, now I'm going to make a forecast. And the track record of economic forecasts is, is dreadful. No serious scientist would think this was a good way to think about it. The idea of saying, well, we've got the model doesn't actually explain the world, but nevertheless, we'll calculate a distribution of shocks in order to square the model with the world. This is a very odd way of going about it, particularly when you don't actually investigate the nature of the shocks. So that people, many of the concepts in economic models don't actually relate to things that really exist out there. So whether it's the natural rate of interest or the natural rate of unemployment, these are concepts which are very useful in the context of a particular theoretical model, but they're not law, they're not constants of nature that you can go out and observe in the world. And the, you know, it, what's interesting is that because of radical uncertainty, which in essence is basically recognizing that we don't have enough information to predict the future. And we can't have enough, in the nature of the process is one that we can't have enough information about it. We need to recognize that. What I find interesting about this is that, you know, I mentioned COVID-19 before as an, an early example of radical uncertainty for us. Well, the epidemiological models that we use to make predictions about the spread of COVID-19 and the number of deaths turn out to be just as bad as most economic forecasts, and for very much the same reason, which is the epidemiological models, some very interesting mathematical, mathematical models of epidemics, are very helpful and important in understanding the nature of an epidemic, how it builds up slowly and accelerates through the population, eventually dies away. And the ideas, the insights from these models are very important. But what was odd was that when COVID-19 hit, it should have been pretty obvious to anyone using a model that the key parameters in that model were unknowable at that point. We had no idea what the nature of the virus was. We didn't know how contagious it was. We didn't know what the mortality rate was. The purpose of the models should have been, we, so we don't know much about this virus, but these are things we need to find out. And these are the data that we should be collecting in order to find out. So, for example, with the benefit of hindsight, I think if we started carrying out random tests in the population quite early on, we'd have had a much stronger handle on the likely mortality rate. But instead, the modelers thought, I've got this great model. People want to know how many people are going to die. I'll tell them. And to do that, they made up the numbers. They would call it an educated guess about some of the key parameters. But basically, they made them up. And this is true in so many areas of economics where people are reluctant to say, we don't know. And my experience was that as a policymaker, one of the most important things to be able to do is to say, I don't know. Yeah, that makes, makes a lot of sense. And I, I remember in your webinar, uh, 
uh, with Princeton's Griswold Center in September. That was one of your critiques uh, of the Fed and, and of other central banks is that they haven't been vocal enough in saying, we don't know you, what the, if these forecasts are actually going to be correct. And um, uh, can you talk a little bit about that? I know you had a lot of critiques about how central banks have you know, treated both the crisis and now this uptick in inflation that we're seeing in the aftermath. So I, I remember when we were discussing models and their uses by central banks, that people asked a question after the financial crisis when interest rates had been cut very substantially, we started doing quantitative easing. What do we think the effects of these policies will be? And are there any new policy instruments that we could think of that would ease some of the constraints? And so people came up with the idea of forward guidance. Now, there is something really silly about this idea. And it basically stems from the obvious point that the Federal Reserve has no idea what is the right interest rate to set six months from now, let alone in 2023 or 2024. And the danger with forward guidance is that people start to think that's what they're going to do. Even if you try and make speeches saying, well, it's of course only conditional, but it's very hard to understand what it's conditioned on. And I think it makes much more sense to say, well, we, I don't know what interest rate we're gonna set six months from now. That will depend on where the economy goes, but what you can be confident of, is that we'll take all the actions we think are needed to ensure that inflation is on track to meet the target. What that means in practice will depend on how the economy evolves. And the reason why that's important is that markets, when they form a forward curve about interest rates, it's a conflation of the reaction function of the central bank about which you do not want markets to be uncertain and a view about the path of the economy. And there's no reason why the view of the central bank about the path of the economy should be the same as the view of the markets. People have different views about that. And that's something which the market will then drive in when determining the forward curves for interest rates. But the reason we got into this mess, I think, was that if you set policy in the model, in the model, well, you can control it. You can decide how, by how many basis points you need to change interest rates in order to raise inflation in the future by 37 basis points. So you, you get a completely false view of how precisely one can control inflation by changing policy today and then announcing the path of interest rates that you're going to follow. And there are two big problems with this. One which I saw in practice in the Swedish Riksbank, which was you know, people had different views on the committee, that's normal. But they ended up spending most of their time debating what, what should the interest rate be three years from now, rather than what should the interest rate be today. And once you start doing that path, you take your eye off the ball of what's the right thing to do today. That, that can be very, very dangerous, I think. And the second way in which it can go wrong is that you get seduced into doing what the Federal Reserve announced um, last year, in August last year, which was so-called flexible average inflation targeting, in which you say, you know, inflation has been a below target. If you look at the Federal Reserve's preferred measure of inflation, the uh, PCE deflator for consumption expenditure, and you, you look at the core measure of that, which is what the Fed looks at, it takes out volatile food and energy prices, the remarkable thing is that over the last decade, that figure was always between one and 2%. Now that's a little below the 2% target, but frankly, given the history of inflation, which led us to inflation targeting, this is nirvana. This is a sort of fantastic outcome. Now it's shot up. It's not between one and 2% now, it's over 4%. This is a dramatic change. But the idea that, well, we've been, you know, on average half a percentage point below the target. So why don't we aim to be above the target for a little bit for a certain period to offset the previous undershoots of the target? Now, the Fed didn't spell out by how much 
inflation will be overshot and for how long. But you could be absolutely confident they didn't have in mind allowing core PCE inflation to go up to over 4% and CPI inflation to go to over 6% because there are things in the world that are not in the model. And the model gives you the illusion that you can control inflation so precisely, that you can work out precisely how many more unemployed people there will be if you raise interest rates by 25 basis points. The fact is we don't know. And it's much better not to pretend that we have that knowledge and then some, when something goes wrong, as it clearly has now, you know, the whole basis of the framework does look now extremely implausible. So I, I, yeah, people are misusing models. It's not that models are wrong. Models are never right or wrong. They're either useful or not useful. But they can be misused. And I think if you believe it, use them to produce some a false degree of precision, what I'll call bogus quantification, then you misuse the model and you get bad policy decisions. So in that sense, forward guidance kind of presumes that this radical uncertainty like doesn't truly exist, you know, for the Fed to commit to setting lower interest rates in the future. They're saying, we know what's going to happen. These are the interest rates that, that we're going to set. We know enough of what's going to happen that we're confident we can give guidance. And I think it, what is so extraordinary about today is that anybody looking at the current economic position would say it is highly uncertain. Every single day we get some more news about COVID, the pandemic, as well as many other aspects of the world. What's happening between the US and China, the future of Taiwan. There are so many things going on. But the idea that we can capture them all in terms of a an exhaustive list of all the things that could happen and a set of probabilities so we can price all the uncertainty strikes me as wholly unrealistic and you would think therefore that in this uncertainty a natural response to policy would be to say we must keep all our options open we'll make the judgments as we go along but given how uncertain the present is you know we've got to be prepared to reverse course if, if information changes but the last thing we're going to do is to pretend that we can tell you where we're going with interest rates over the next 12, 48, 12, 24 months. Uh, that just doesn't make any sense. It's not credible. No one's going to believe it. It's better to say, this is what we know today. This is what we don't know. Given what we know, this is the policy we're setting today, but we're ready to change it in the light of new information. So policymaking under radical uncertainty is really about transparency and, and admitting we, we don't know, essentially. Exactly. And I think that the key word you use is transparency. And it, my big question about transparency is transparency of what? And I think what we want are policymakers who will honestly describe, this is what we know, this is what we don't know. That's why we made our decision. Now, the decision may turn out to be right. It may turn out to be wrong. But this is why we took it. What I worry about with transparency are first that, for example, the Federal Reserve has to publish transcripts of its deliberations after I think it's seven years, some period in the UK, similar now. I don't think this is a good idea because I think it's very important for policymakers to be able to have private conversations, to be able to say to each other, you know, what is going on here? Um, and to, to talk about things in an honest, open, in a, in a way you'd have with a conversation. If, if you felt, you know, Sam, that every conversation you had had to be broadcast in a podcast, that would limit the kind of conversations you would have because you'd know that everyone could see them and you'd think, well, how will they react to that? There's got to be an opportunity for central banks to have private conversations. The transparency we want is to force policymakers to explain why they took the decisions they did and to respond to challenge to that, to be questioned in Congress or by journalists or others about why did you make this assumption? Why did you make this judgment? That's the transparency we want. We don't want people going around speculating about what they will do in the future. 
And what I learned from being in a central bank was, certainly in a central bank, and I think it applies more generally, there's only one law of communication, which is don't say anything until you have something to say. And then you explain it clearly and transparently. Did your experience at the Bank of England, you know, having to oversee the economy through the great financial crisis, in a sense, influence some of the ideas that you've put out in, in radical uncertainty? Yes, it certainly did. One reason, I, I went back um, in 2009 when it was clear that we had not only had a major banking crisis, but we had realized that recapitalizing the banking system was a solution to the banking crisis. And that's what we did. The UK, I'm pleased to say, was the first country to move in that direction. But then we, we experienced towards the end of 2008 and the first half of 2009, a very deep recession in which world trade was falling faster than it had in the 1930s. So this was a big event. And I went back to what people wrote and talked about in the 1930s. And I was very struck that after the Great Depression, there was a major rethink of both economics and politics. It was a period of great intellectual turmoil. Keynes produced a general theory. Many people who were previously rather uninterested in politics joined the Communist Party. In other countries, some joined the Fascist Party. Politics was not boring. I mean, it, people really became very excited about it. They were talking about you know, do we want a market economy? How does it work? After the banking crisis, 2008, uh, I was struck by how little excitement there seemed to be about perhaps we should rethink our ideas about whether a market economy is self-stabilizing. We got into a point just before 2008 where people felt now we, you know, we basically solved the major macroeconomic problems of demand management. Um, now we can study something else. This is very reminiscent of 19th century physics, where some of the greatest names in physics in the 19th century said, well, you know, we've done all the major issues in physics, so just a few wrinkles left to work on. And then, of course, you know, 20, 30 years later, Einstein comes along and blows that out of the water. So it did seem to me that actually the financial crisis should make us think deeply about why some of our beliefs about a market economy may be wrong. And it did seem to me that, you know, thinking about Keynes versus the arrow de Brewer model, thinking about radical uncertainty, what did that mean? Um, when Frank Knight talked about risk versus uncertainty, he was talking about entrepreneurs, new products, new ideas, new processes. <clears throat> he didn't believe that you could think about a capitalist economy without thinking about what we call radical uncertainty. And indeed, if you're thinking about macroeconomic fluctuations, big changes are in our economies, which are essentially capitalist economies, it does strike me it's very difficult to understand that without thinking deeply about entrepreneurship about what drives investment and hence the influence of radical uncertainty. So the financial crisis did trigger in my mind, the need to rethink what was going on and to go back and read what happened and what came out of the 1930s, not just to assume that we could write off the financial crisis as either, oh, it's just an unusually big shock that we can't explain or understand or we had a friction in the model that we didn't, we left out a, a, a friction from the model. Let's think of a new friction to put into the model and change a first order condition. Neither of these seem to me to get to grips with the essence of what had happened in the financial crisis. Yeah, uh, that makes a lot of sense. I think uh, I took a class with uh, Bill Dudley, a former pres president of the New York Fed. And, and one of the things he said is that there was a real failure of imagination you know, on the part of uh, financial institutions, regulatory institutions, 
is it possible to avoid failures of imagination? Like, can we prevent you know, an unforeseeable crisis? So I think this is exactly the right phrase to use, failure of imagination. And it's not possible to eliminate it totally because we can't imagine all the things that could happen in the future. But what it does mean is it's very important not to be seduced by one model and think that this is the answer. Now, the people who build the models, they're bound to feel that. They want to prove their model is correct. And if, they, if there's something happens that they can't explain, they tinker with it, try and improve it. But what is very important is that from time to time, we sit down and we ask the question, you know, what could go wrong here? And I, I think that in our book, we basically say there are two questions that people should ask before making any decision. The first one is, what is going on here? That is to try to understand that where we are today is a unique set of circumstances. It's not just describe, you know, this is not like Mars going around the sun endlessly in a way that's wholly predictable. New things are happening all the time. The world is changing. So what is going on here? And the second question is what we should be trying to manage is, is risk. But risk is not best measured by volatility, which is the basic view in finance theory. Risk is measured by what could go wrong relative to what we call a reference narrative or people imagining what they think is a sensible path for them, their families, their businesses to move along. What could derail that path? And then you do need to think imaginatively about you know, what could possibly go wrong. And you know, some things you can imagine. So we could imagine pandemics. It wasn't that a pandemic was unimaginable, but we didn't take it seriously enough. We didn't think about resilience, which is what you have to do. We, still, we take climate change seriously. But again, one of the weaknesses in that debate is that people are so determined to make precise forecasts about by how much the temperature will go up in a way that I think is probably completely implausible. We just don't know enough to be confident of that. But we can be confident that it's something we should take seriously and therefore ask questions about how can we mitigate the damage and what sort of policies would be appropriate to diminish the impact of climate change on temperatures. You don't have to forecast precisely in order to realize that certain policies make sense. And thinking of risk in that way, trying to use your imagination by, first of all, what is going on here? What's happening today that I didn't think about before? And what could go wrong relative to the path I think I'm on? strikes me as the two questions that we should try and force ourselves. If you're running a business, force yourself to put that into the way in which the company operates. And it's a useful exercise you know, for all of us to do, maybe on New Year's Day when we start to make these New Year's resolutions. But I think Bill is right to think of that phrase as being critical. And I think the proof of it was you know, David Vignard and his modelers of risk, which was, it wasn't a 25 standard deviation event. It was the models simply were the wrong models to understand what was going on at that point. I think that's a really good note to, to end on to really bring us full circle. Uh, given that the name of our show is Policy Punchline, I have to ask, what's the punchline here about central banking, uncertainty, inflation, or, or anything else? So, I think the it's it's very much what I've just been saying. I think you've got to think about what is going on here because each decision is being taken in a set of unique circumstances. We're not just rolling a dice and it's oh it's come down heads today, but we know what the outcomes are. We need to understand what's going on here. And then we need to avoid bogus quantification. Far too, you know. Models are being misused all the time, whether it's in economic forecasts, forward guidance, making decisions on infrastructure investments in transport, for example. People want 
to be given a number that justifies a decision. And you can't do that all the time. You have to be prepared to make decisions in a world of uncertainty. And that's a big lesson we've learned from COVID and should have learned from the financial crisis is that resilience is just as important, if not more so than efficiency or profitability. And the banking system was not resilient, even though it had been very profitable and apparently very efficient. And resilience means that you ensure the system can survive a shock that comes along. You need to build redundancy into the system. You need to think carefully about what would happen when things go wrong. And I think that this is very important as we go forward because we need our health systems to be more resilient so we can cope with pandemics. We need, our, we need the electricity supply to be extraordinarily resilient. Um, all our lives depend critically on the use of electricity from our ability to have this conversation, to be able to cook the dinner tonight. Um, focusing on those issues, I think, are the big conclusion that's important for policy. And the, the lesson which I suspect that many businesses have drawn from COVID-19, and ones which collectively we need to draw when making public policy decisions. That concludes this episode of Policy Punchline. Uh, thanks so much for being here with me today, uh, Lord King, and thanks everyone for listening. Thank you, Sam. You've been listening to Policy Punchline, a podcast generously supported by the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance at Princeton University. We would also like to encourage you to follow other podcasts produced by Princeton University, such as Politics and Polls by the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. Policy Punchline is intended to be informational only and does not reflect nor represent the views of Princeton University or the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance. For more information on subscription, donation, volunteering, or contact, please visit policypunchline.com. Thank you again for listening.